Hello and welcome to the second day of the Web Global Impact Week. Today, we are going to be under the theme of economic sustainers. A full day of truly phenomenal speakers who will help you understand better how we can grow the economy, sustain in a sustainable way, and um, make the impossible possible. We're all well aware of the challenges that the way we produce energy, the way we build our economies today impact the climate and further the reality of the climate change that we face at all around the planet with almost no exception these days. It's very hard to talk about this while at the same time for the past two years, COVID has basically freezed so many areas of our economic development, but it is what it is. And this is the reason for Webit to exist in the first place, to bring together some of the finest, bravest, and most beautiful minds in the world and to give them these challenges and many more, hopefully, for finding the best solution for building the desirable future. And today's full day is not going to be an exception. This is, of course, my personal opinion, but I am absolutely convinced that the Keynes and Keynesianism is no longer valid. We live in a world in which we see not the scarcity of the resources as a driver for economic development, but I believe and I see the abundance of opportunities which will bring us to this new and desirable future. In the world that I live in, there is no need of competition because of the abundance of opportunities. The only need is of cooperation, working together, being together, understanding and accepting our differences and building on these grounds what I call desirable future. There is one person who created a word which I kind of like very much. And this word we have been talking about together for the past few weeks. And uh, that's why I, I, um, I will be most probably the first one to say it. It is trivergence. Trivergence. Let me explain you what trivergence is. Oh no, sorry. I have someone better than me to explain you what is the meaning of trivergence. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to have here someone who has kind of, uh, of um, engraved the word blockchain in his first book and now being executive chairman of the Blockchain Research Institute and uh, best-selling author he will tell you about trivergence, thriving in the second era of the digital age. Dear friends, a hundred thousand of you from all, all over the world, I have the pleasure to present to you Mr. Don Tapsko. Don, welcome, the floor is yours. Hello, it's um, great to be with you, although I'd rather be physically in one location. But um, this is the new world that we're all getting used to. Um, the global pandemic is really a, a turning point in history. And it's, of course, changing everything. Um, it's, a, it's a devastating. Um, the human and economic costs are still unfathomable. Um, but it is a turning point in history in the sense that it's causing profound changes to our economy, our behavior, our society. Uh, some leaders in governments that have uh, failed, uh, will be dis displaced or have been displaced. And many institutions are being 
scrutinized and hopefully changed for the better. Um, also, it's shown with searing clarity weaknesses in many of our systems, our systems for supply chains, um, our systems for healthcare data and others. And when the dust settles, as it surely will soon, um, how should we think differently about business? So the pandemic has sped up many of the themes of the digital age. We're all working online and presenting online and conferencing and shopping online and entertaining ourselves online and uh, uh, staying fit online and learning online and so on. Um, and many of these trends of the digital age have been accelerated by years or even decades. But also that not only creates a demand pull for change, we have a technology push for change as well. It's coming from a new era of technology. So let me just give you a little uh, background on that. Um, I began to uh, uh, write books in the early 1980s um, arguing that computers would be used by everyone as a communications tool. And um, uh, my mother bought most of the copies of those books. They were studies in bad timing. But I started writing bestsellers in the early 90s, Paradigm Shift, which was obviously a big book. And The Digital Economy was the first bestseller about the web um, in business. And 20 years later, I was asked to write the anniversary edition of The Digital Economy. And I came to some conclusions. Uh, one is that we are really entering a second age. And we, we've come through mainframes, mini computers, PCs, the internet, the web, the mobile web, social media, the cloud, big data. And now we have a second era of technology that's emerging where technology infuses itself throughout the physical world, billions and trillions of inert objects becoming smart communicating devices where we have um, technologies that learn to do things that they weren't programmed to do, machine learning. And I concluded that the foundational technology for this second era was in fact the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies or blockchain. And the reason is, this is not just the operating system for the emerging new economy, it's the second era of the internet. Think about it, for 40 years, we've had an internet of information. But if I send you some information, a PDF of this deck or an email or photo, I'm actually not sending you the information, I'm sending you a copy. And that works great for information. But when it comes to assets, things of value like money or stocks or bonds or swaps, securities, contracts, deeds, intellectual property, the data in our identity, cultural assets like art or music, votes. Vote is an asset, something of value that belongs to somebody. Copying those is not a good idea, okay? You don't want someone copying your, your identity or your vote or the song that you just wrote. And if I send you a thousand euros, it's really important that I don't still have the money, right? So cryptographers have called this the double spend problem for decades. And the way that we manage this problem today is through middlemen, banks, credit card companies, uh, stock markets, uh, transfer agents, social media companies. They perform all of the business and transaction logic of every type of business. They identify the party that you are you. They identify the asset that's a euro or a stock or something. They clear and settle transactions. They keep records. And overall, they've done a pretty good job, but there are growing problems. They use centralized servers. That means that they can be hacked. They exclude a couple of billion people from the global economy. They take too much of the value. Why does it cost 10 to 20% for a housekeeper in Toronto to send money to her mom in the Philippines? And why does it take four to seven days? And the big problem is they capture our data. So we create the asset of the digital age. They capture it. And this is resulting in a bifurcation of wealth. For the first time in modern history, the economy is growing. The middle class is shrinking. We have wealth creation, but declining prosperity. So what if, what if there were not just an internet of information? What if there were an internet of value? Some kind of vast global distributed ledger 
spreadsheet around the world and everyone has a copy where everything of value from money to intellectual property to a vote can be managed, stored, transacted peer to peer. That's what Satoshi Nakamoto solved in 2008. Satoshi cracked the double spend problem. Now, Bitcoin was just the beginning because now we have a new internet of value emerging where anything of value can be managed, stored, transacted, communicated peer to peer. And trust is not achieved by an intermediary. It's achieved by cryptography and collaboration and some clever code, which is why my son Alex and I call it the trust protocol. So I had this great analogy on why these new blockchain platforms were more secure. But um, the American comedian, um, British actually, on American TV, John Oliver, uh, did a show on blockchain, and uh, he had some fun with my analogy. You'll see why I don't use it anymore. Here we go. And because of the complicated process the network uses to verify records, it is very secure. Now, relax. I'm not going to get into what that process is or how it works, but I will share a really helpful, really dumb metaphor for why it is safe. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, someday someone will be able to do that, but for now, it's going to be tough. Hold on. That is an absolutely horrible thought. So why is that reporter so happy about the idea? Because if anyone ever figures out how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken, that chicken is going to be <laughs> up. Spent the rest of his life suffering from PTSD and writing haunting poetry about the experience. The things I saw. Buck, buck, buckor. My body is whole, but what of my soul? My body is whole, but what of my soul? So you can see why I don't use the analogy. I still think it's a good one. Anyway, so Bitcoin was to the internet of value the first app, kind of like the first app of the Internet of Information was email. 40 years ago, I was using email connected to an ARPANET. But now we have these general purpose platforms that look more like the web, where you can build any app. Hyperledger from the Linux Foundation. Ethereum. Ethereum, I was talking to some bankers in Canada recently, and I said, uh, do you know there's a uh, an organization that has greater value than all of you combined, every Canadian bank. You ever heard of it? They're like, what? It's called Ethereum. It's worth over half a trillion dollars. Ethereum was the first to enable smart contracts. Very important because a lot of what we do in business are agreements. These can now be automated. They police themselves. They self-execute. They got a bank in the contract. And now we have these extraordinary new platforms coming up, Polkadot and Cosmos, the internet of blockchains, um, that these are amazing new platforms that look more like the web and enable us to build any app. So when all is said and done, there are these three technologies that matter. And let me introduce a new word, and I'll use Webit to do that, called the trivergence. The trivergence is the combination of AI machine learning, the internet of things and blockchain. And in the center of this is something called data. So the promise of this technology is quite extraordinary. And I did get lucky with this book, Blockchain Revolution. It's the big book on the topic. Uh, I also got lucky with my co-author, my son, Alex. Turns out he's a better writer than I am probably. But in the book, we laid up this vision. This was six years ago. Now, this is a new edition here. But we laid out a, a vision of what could happen. And the book held up very well and still is a valuable resource today. Let me just describe seven of about 20 transformations that we're working on at the Blockchain Research Institute. First is financial services. Now, we have these three types of currencies or money that are emerging. They're the self-organizing currencies like Bitcoin. And um, the amazing thing about Bitcoin is that it works. 
And there are now many, many, many millions of people who use Bitcoin. Entire countries have adopted Bitcoin as a fiat currency, and its market value is well over um, uh, two trillion dollars. Then we have corporate currencies. Now the big one here was Libra, then called DM from Facebook. But Facebook has pretty much thrown in the towel on that, and they've now partnered with another stablecoin or cryptocurrency because. Um, you know, there's lots of controversy about Facebook, but Zuckerberg is right that sending money from Toronto to Manila should be as easy as sending a text message. And if Facebook does that, notwithstanding all the problems with Facebook, that could bring a half a billion people into the global economy almost overnight. And then we have central bank digital currencies. This is the digital euro, the digital dollar, the digital yen and yuan and RMB and so on. And all countries will do this. This is being led by China. There's a lot of hand wringing because China's CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency called DCEP, is now being rolled out across Southeast Asia, one belt, one road linking Hong Kong and Rotterdam. And there's a lot of controversy about this. China's partner in this is Big Brother. And uh, and this will also displace the U.S. dollar as the currency of record. So the, the Fed is trying to figure out what to do about this. But I believe all fiat currencies will become digital currencies, too. We don't have this today. Now, secondly, it's bringing about big changes to the financial industry as well. This is something called a Rube Goldberg machine. <laughs> it's a, it's a um, super complicated machine that does something really simple like crack an egg or, or uh, open, a, open a door. And that's kind of the financial industry, if you think about it. It's an industry that does some pretty simple things, but it's unbelievably complicated. I mean, you tap your card and it's Starbucks and a bunch of messages go through six companies and, uh, and, and three days later, a clearing and settlement occurred. Well, if all of that were based on a blockchain, there would be no three-day settlement period because the payment and the settlement's the same activity, right? It's just a change to the ledger. There would be no delay, no cost of all these counterparties, no uh, counterparty risk. And that's what almost got us in 2008. So the banking industry, and uh, this is something that Alex uh, has developed, does nine things. It stores value. It used to be in safes, now it's in computer systems. You don't need a bank to store money now. It can be stored on a decentralized network or to store stocks or any other asset. They move value, you know, payment systems, moving stuff. Well, again, all of that can be done by software. They lend value. Well, today, if you own some digital assets, you can use those as collateral to borrow money. And there's no danger of you defaulting. Um, you know, the old, your broker calls you up and does a margin call and says, you got to sell some stock because you're over leverage. That can't happen because there's a smart contract that governs this. And if you start to become over leverage, then, then the contract specifies that the situation will be fixed. You know, you exchange value, stock markets and so on. Well, now there are, there are digital exchanges that are worth more than NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. And some of them are decentralized, Uniswap. Um, Uniswap has a treasury of $10 billion that makes it as big as just about every corporation in the United States or 20 companies that might have a bigger treasury. So on and on and on it goes, authenticating value. You have the big audit companies to do that. Well, with triple entry accounting, you don't need an audit company because um, there's a debit and a credit, but automatically there's an entry on a blockchain. So you can have an audit, ultimately this is where it'll go, at two o'clock this afternoon. You just hit the audit button. So everything the banking industry does can be done by software. So this is quite an extraordinary new development. Now, um, furthermore, all assets are being digitized. Cryptocurrencies are just one of nine types of assets. You have protocol tokens that enable something like smart contracts to work in Ethereum. There are governance tokens 
that sort of you're like a shareholder, only you don't get to vote once a year at the annual general meeting. You get to your allocated tokens and you get to be involved in the decision making about how the funds of a platform are allocated. Um, there are NFTs, non fungible tokens. We talked about this idea six years ago in blockchain revolution. Like a Bitcoin is fungible. One Bitcoin equals another Bitcoin, although they can be divided. But the Mona Lisa is not fungible. There's only one Mona Lisa. So we have this explosion of the tokens representing physical things or even being a token of value itself, like a digital painting or art. We have exchange tokens that enable exchanges to work. Security tokens are the really big one. And they're all stocks will be, and, and other securities will become tokenized. There was a token generation event that raised $4 billion. There was no investment bank, no stock market, no stock. People buying tokens that represent an interest in the company. Natural asset tokens that represent something like a carbon credit and central bank digital currency tokens. So this is the tokenization of all assets. And it's shaking the windows and rattling the walls of the financial industry. FinTech was this big. DeFi is as big as this room. DeFi is now the fastest growing technology related industry in the world. And it's, um, it's just exploding. So I'm, I will share some resources with you that we've made available to the public. You don't have to pay $150,000. Um, and these are now summarized in some books. Financial Services Revolution, take a screenshot. It's available on amazon.com. So that's the financial industry. Let me speed it up for a few others. Supply chains. How can it be in 2021 that the president of the United States says our big problem is supply chains? How is this possible? Well. You have planes and boats and trains, and trucks and uh, pipelines, and, and there are all these different partners and players and contractors. And, and then all this information is moving around with paper and faxes and phone calls and email and, and uh, traditional EDI and ERP. And there are borders and escrow agents and tax authority. Imagine if this were a shared network state, blockchain on a ledger, real-time transactions. There could be a single version of the truth. You could have smart payments. Um, payment is made when someone does something. You send your, you know, an example, be if you send your kid to university, you give him some money, you hope he spends it on books and tuition and not in the bar. Well, if the money were smart, he goes into the bar and orders a mojito and uh, the money says, sorry, uh, um, Frederico, I don't do mojitos, you know, so this is now possible. And the whole supply chain is being reinvented around blockchain. You know, third of the fish that you eat in a restaurant is inappropriately labeled. It's cheap fish labeled as expensive fish or endangered fish labeled as something else. This problem is now being solved by the FishCon project, where you're going to know everything about that fish, including how old it is or when it was when it was uh, killed, um, what the fish ate. You probably know where the fish exactly where it came from, what temperature it moved through the supply chain and so on. The IBM Food Trust, it used to take Walmart three months to find out where a poison avocado came from. Now they can do it in 20 seconds. So all of this is described in the book Supply Chain Revolution. It's the first book to talk about supply chains in a pandemic and how blockchain could help fix that. The next thing is healthcare. Big opportunities here. Um, and uh, the University Health Network, before you leave the hospital after your x-ray, your radiology report is in your health record and you have access to it. The next step would be you can communicate that record, get a second opinion monetize it, anonymize it, and give it to science. Number four, energy and climate. We have a big problem here. We need to reduce carbon by 90% in the next 20 years. And even if we do, bad things are going to happen. You're going to, we already have a billion and a half people losing their water supply. And it'll take a thousand years for the planet to cool down. 
we need to mobilize planet Earth to reindustrialize the planet. The first thing is we need a new distributed, decentralized green energy grid. Blockchain will be the platform for that. And that light bulb is going to buy power from a distributed power source. And, and when it makes the payment, its reputation as a trustworthy light bulb will be enhanced. And um, these transactions are not going to go through Visa. They're going to go through a distributed ledger. But we can also change the behavior of individuals by tokenizing carbon credits. And you're going to buy that carbon neutral espresso machine because it comes with all these tokens that represent a carbon credit. And they're fungible. <laughs> you can do things with them, buy stuff. You can turn them into money if you want. Property rights is a huge topic. 70% of land titles in the developing world are not enforceable. You're in Honduras, a dictator comes to power. He says, well, you may have a piece of paper that says you own your land, but our central government computer says my friend owns your land. It's actually happened. Well, it's a big problem in India. Haryana province is now building a land registry based on blockchain. And if you get a land title on that, nobody can mess with it. No dictator, no corrupt uh, clerk, nothing, unless you know how to turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Whoops, I'm sorry, shouldn't use that one. The sixth one I'm very passionate about is our identity. The virtual you knows more about you than you do. And you can't remember what you bought a year ago or said a year ago or what, what that medication you took. And um, dozens of classes of data. You create it, but it gets captured by these digital conglomerates. And the, this is a new species of business. And these entities own half of NASDAQ. They own 22% of the S&P 500. They own the asset of the digital age. That means you can't use the data to plan your life. You can't monetize it. It's not secure. We can't aggregate it for social purposes and your privacy is being undermined. So we can now have a self-sovereign identity that's owned by you and it sweeps up all this transactional data for you. We can get our identities back to manage them responsibly for ourselves. The final one I'll mention today is government. Um, we can have better government, finally, because we have a platform that manages assets. But we can also have a better democracy. And I don't think I have to convince anyone watching this, that there's a crisis of legitimacy of our democratic institutions. The United States, a third of the population thinks the election was stolen. The most scrutinized election in American history, every vote was counted multiple times by reputable authorities where all parties were observing, um, lawsuits and so on. So the internet has kind of contributed to this with a fragmentation of public discourse. And we need to solve this problem. Legitimacy is the idea that you may disagree with who's in power, but at least you think the system is a good one. Well, all around the world, people are questioning democracy. We need a second era. You know, the first era we created these representative institutions, but there was a weak public mandate. Citizens were inert. Uh, politicians are beholden to big money. And um, there was opacity. How about a second era? enabled by this second era of the internet, where we can have smart votes, a culture of public deliberation, active citizenship, transparency, and the idea of politicians being responsible and accountable to citizens. You have a smart vote. You vote for the politician. You also vote for their platform. And if they don't implement it, there are consequences. So, these are seven transformations. Final screen shot for you to take is uh, this is my new book. It's called Platform Revolution. And it talks about how blockchain and trivergence are the platform for a new economy. Yep, there are lots of challenges. You know, this is taking time. The second era is causing big changes. FedEx can't just go reinvent itself like it did in the past around technology, it's got to change the entire logistics industry. And that's what the executives there say. There's some technology weaknesses. Blockchain has an image problem. Most of it is not valid. You know, it's used by criminals. You know what? 
In Europe, criminals do use a currency. It's called the euro. 1% of Bitcoin may be used for nefarious purposes, but 3% of cash is used by criminals. And criminals are always the first to adopt a new technology ever. This is like fear of what we don't understand. And there's a bigger question too. This new era is going to create some big challenges in society. And I think that I mentioned a, you know, the issue of how do we inform ourselves in a society where the old ways of doing that are failing. And I think that we're going to need a new social contract for the digital age. As we went from the agrarian age to the digital, to the industrial age, we figured out some things. We figured out that people need to be educated. We need a public education system, create a law. You have to go to school. It's a law. We, we knew that people live in the city, so we created a social safety net and so on. I don't think we've done any of that. So if you Google my name and the new social contract, I think we need a declaration of interdependence. And that's what I'm working on now. To close, this is a new paradigm. You get one of these, you get a leadership crisis, vested interests fight against change, and leaders of old paradigms have great difficulty embracing the new. We created the Blockchain Research Institute to help close this gap between the potential of trivergence and its actual deployment. Can you do this? Can you be a leader? Can your company, your country? You know, I think that leadership is really not, and, and the future is not something to be predicted. The future is something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future if we will it. Let me end with an analogy. Fish come in schools, uh, bees come in swarms, starlings come in something called a murmuration. And a murmuration is a word in the English dictionary. And I think that there's an analogy here that's helpful. Starlings are out over a 20 mile radius throughout the day doing their starling thing, foraging for food and so on. And at night, they come together and they create one of the most spectacular things in all of nature. And the murmuration has a function. It warms the birds up for the cold night ahead. And it also protects the birds from predators. You can see on the screen here, a predator, a fierce killer of uh, starlings being chased away by the collective power of the little birds, 25 times the size of a starling. Scientists that have studied this say they've never seen an accident. And there's leadership, but there's no one leader. Now, is this some kind of fanciful analogy or could we learn something from it? The murmuration functions according to this principles of the second era that I just described to you. It's a collaboration. There's no middleman here. And uh, remember I said trust is achieved through cryptography. There's code in the, in the DNA of the birds that gives it some rules. A really big rule is don't get, don't bump into somebody else. But another rule is don't get too far away. And the murmuration has a great, what I would call an interdependence. I don't think business can succeed in a world that's failing. And surely the pandemic has shown us that. We now have a new variant, Omicron, we need to get the whole world vaccinated. We need to solve problems of world health. Increasingly, all problems are global problems. And the murmuration functions, that is, the interest of an individual bird is connected to the interest of the murmuration as a whole. And finally, the murmuration has what I would call a great integrity, a great integrity. But what is integrity? Well, it's, among other things, it's the foundation of trust. Trust is the expectation that the other parties will act with integrity. Trust is the expectation that the other party will do the right thing. And which is why a little bird will chase after a predator 25 times its size because it knows that the other birds will do the right thing. It knows that they will have its back. And I look at this and I get a lot of hope. I mean, imagine if we connected ourselves on this planet through some kind of network of glass and air and cryptography and collaboration. 
What intractable problems could we solve? I look at this and I get a lot of hope that this smaller, more decentralized network that my grandchildren inherit might actually be a better one. And that this age of networks intelligence might be an age where the promise of the digital economy is finally fulfilled. It's really up to you. Can you be a leader for this change? Let's do this, okay? Thank you very much.